launch the first edition. As we launch the first edition of the minimum standards. Um, I have a few opening remarks to make. And as we're doing that, we hope that more people will be joining. I'm happy to see um, some just logging in right now. So that makes me really happy. If you haven't yet, could you please put your where you're joining us from into the chat. Bruce, we're viewing your screen, which is great. Thank you. And really nice to, to be reading. Uh, I've seen Cameroon, I've seen South Sudan, um, Ecuador, Peru. So we have people joining from all over the world. It's very nice. The displacement of people and communities due to natural disasters and conflict has long been part of human history. And despite that, we know that today there are more people being displaced than ever before and that the humanitarian needs are very high. And this comes with a very big responsibility to try to improve the response to those situations. These have been not just words to our working group, but we have really tried to take the interagency standing committee um, aim to ensure predictability, to have accountability and to work in partnership as a duty as we have, under, as we have undertaken the process of working on these minimum standards. So we're very happy that you're here to celebrate with us today. And when we started this work, the, the task of developing a handbook seemed really large, but as colleagues, we knew that there was both a demand to have a common set of standards to measure the work that we were doing as camp management, and we also knew that it was long overdue. I was fortunate to be part of the group of friends that started the Camp Management Toolkit Project in 2002. And I will tell you that we used to sit to eat lunch and share good ideas about distributions or livelihood projects because we had neighboring camps along the Bow Kenema Highway. And it seemed that writing these ideas down was very far reaching. Um, and in a way it was because we were doing this before our sector was officially recognized by the cluster system or it had been established. But the circumstances of the last 20 years has really changed quite a lot. And as we were doing the consultations around the minimum standards, I have to say that I was really struck by the fact that our profession and our practice of CCCM has changed a lot over the last, over the last years. And that we really do need a common language for working together that can bring us together across agencies and we've built this, I think, in our minimum standards that we're launching today. We need to do this so that we can and should act to be able to influence the operational conditions in a positive way. So while CCCM is an area that links communities with services and problems with solutions, we can now do so at a higher level of accountability because we can define our actions to support the rights and dignity of people living in camps by having them clear among ourselves. This will also help us understand, help others understand what it is that we do and further increase the buy-in and the integration of CCCM into humanitarian responses. Today, I'm very pleased that we are here and marked, marking this occasion with some very special guests. You're gonna shortly be hearing from the Director General of IOM through a video address. You'll also be hearing from Mr. Massimo La Rosa, who is with ECHO, ECHO as a thematic expert for forced displacement migration. And he's the special protection advisor for Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the MENA region. We're also gonna hear some short anecdotes from people that we're calling cornerstone believers who helped us get us there. Our friends, Andrew, Gabriel, Nicholas, and Kit. This will be followed by some remarks from Mr. Philip Deloy, who's the CCCM Shelter and Humanitarian Advisor with UK Aid, and then a very special keynote address from the Executive Director of SPHERE, Dr. Balwant Singh. 
Lastly, we wouldn't be launching an event without showing you and demonstrating the platform. So we're gonna do that so that when you print them out on your own computer, you can know also how to use the platform. This is our moment of celebration. We couldn't have made it here today without all of the many contributions of so many people. So you need to indulge me for a minute and I'm gonna say a couple words of thanks. Thank you to the over 850 people from around the world who contributed to the development of these standards through field consultations, online surveys, piloting and field testing. You're gonna see some slides here from our field consultations which took place in Bangladesh, Iraq, South Sudan and Turkey. We also like to thank those that contributed in Latin America. There's too many countries to name and we had to do those consultations by Zoom, but we're really glad you're here joining today. We also want to thank everyone who participated through the online surveys run by PHAP. All of your views were essential in reflecting the diversity and specificity needed in the management of displacement sites. We would also really like to particularly recognize the displaced people in South Sudan and Bangladesh and the others who contributed anonymously online for sharing their firsthand expertise of living in displacement sites and the ways that you helped to make these standards better reflect that reality. I remember in the working group when we voted on that issue, we talked specifically about whether or not we should include the views of people living in camps in these standards. And I'm so glad that we did. I'd also like to remember our friend Monir Udin, who sadly passed away earlier this year. He was one of the people who made the men's focus group discussion in Bangladesh, and he really believed in these standards, and we miss him greatly. I'd like to thank the organizations who gave all their experts time off to come to these consultations. We can't say all the names of the organization. There were over 100 of them. But I would like to point out that it was a really great experience because we got to hear the views of small local organizations on the same platform as large international NGOs. And we could have not have done that if we would have only kept these consultations in Geneva. I would like to thank the donors and organizations that provided funding to IOM and UNHCR and the Danish Refugee Council. We at IOM would like to also thank the donation of UK aid and the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. Piloting of these standards were done by members of the working group in Somalia, Cox Bazaar, Syria, Indonesia, and most recently in Greece. So thanks Catherine, Veronica, Ida, Tia, Elena, Ben, Ingrid, Carrie, Travis, and our new friend, Alex. I'd also like to thank the CCCM Strategic Advisory Group. You made commitments to this early on. You made comments. You demanded that they be referenced in the toolkit. You made it part of our global work plan and you endorsed the final product. Thank you. We would be remiss not to thank the entire team at PHAP, but also um, particularly webinars and surveys that were managed by Marcus, who even did some editing for us. The working group would also like to thank and recognize Aninia, who joined us as a member and then brought in all the HSP partners to make comments for us, including Kit Dyer, who shortly thereafter became our editor. And we would also like to thank those who reviewed our application to be part of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. We're really happy to be part of this family. We're still waiting for our letter from you, but I think it's coming. The early drafters of this work were Sarah, Erica, and David. Thanks for getting us started. There are so many different organizational approaches to site management. Site management support to local authorities, mobile teams working in remote locations or out of camps, as well as traditional camp managers who work day in and day out in planned camps, but more often in self-settled sites, collective and evacuation centers, reception or transit sites. We hope you all find these standards useful in your daily work. We finally have them. Let me turn it over to you, Elena. Thank you so much, Jen. And, uh... It's really great to be here with all of you today. And I just want to um, introduce you a quick um, video that uh, Mr. Vitorino uh, from I understand us with some remarks on the importance of the minimum standards for camp management. Uh, 
IOM has decades of experience. Dear colleagues, forced displacement is a life-altering experience for the millions of people around the world who end up living in camps and displacement sites, in some cases for many years. As the co-leaders of the United Nations Camp Coordination and Camp Management Cluster globally, IOM has decades of expertise in this area. So I am pleased today to mark the launch of the Minimum Standards for Camp Management Handbook and would like to thank all the agencies who contributed towards its publication. These standards are founded on the belief that the rights of all displaced persons must be respected and their needs are met in a dignified manner. While displacement sites are intended to be temporary, they must ensure that those forced to reside there are safe, that their rights are protected and that a suitable quality of life is maintained. These standards outline the work needed to support meaningful engagement among stakeholders within displacement sites, as well as how different agencies and sectors of work can plan and coordinate. Last year, IOM's camp coordination and camp management programs reached over 2.6 million people in 28 countries. The handbook will guide the preparedness, early warning and contingency planning we provide to governments around the world. Working together, we can support the rights of displaced people to a dignified life, especially for those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Well, it's really difficult to take over after uh, such important remark from the Director General of IUM, but let me try. Uh, first of all, I have to say it's great to know that Mr. Vittorino shares our views on the importance of the minimum standards. Um, and as a member of the working group, but also as um, a member of ACTED, an organization that has uh, account management operation in many different countries around the world, I have to say that um, I very much enjoy being part of this journey, uh, working and exchanging views with CCM practitioners all around the world and humanitarian colleagues. And I feel that it was really empowering feeling that we could achieve something so important all together as a community. Um, I also want to say thank you to Jen and Tom, who put so much effort and energies in pushing the standards forward and leading the works of, of the working group. So you heard already so many thanks from Jen, but let me. Uh, let me uh, spend a few words to say thanks to her. Um, but I'm here today uh, not only as a member of the working group, but also as a representative of ACTED, my organization. And I'm speaking on behalf of my uh, ACTED CCM colleague that around the world and over the past years uh, spent time to share their inputs, comments, and views and contributed to the different consultation processes. Um, together with countless colleagues from other organizations, uh, they really uh, allow us to finalize the standard. And I also want to say thanks to them. But uh, I think it's important to remark that uh, my colleagues in the field, my colleagues in Ethiopia, in South Sudan, in DRC, and many other countries around the world are the ones that right now are applying the standards that are incorporating the standards in their monitoring and evaluation framework. They are incorporating the standards in training material and capacity building plans for community and stakeholders. Uh, and they are also using them to advocate on behalf of the affected population to prove the level of assistance uh, in the sites. Um, so the standards, we're launching them now, but they are very much a reality already. Uh, and Last, last words from me is that for those who are familiar with the camp management um, house, um, it's basically a, an image that we use in trainings and capacity building activities to visualize uh, the core components of camp management. Uh, in the camp management house, you have two bricks that keep the house stable and standing and are the foundation of the house, international law and standards and community participation. The walls of the house are assistance and protection, so two pillars that keep the affected population safe. And the roof, represented by camp management, keep all the affected population sheltered. 
So I want to say that the best thing uh, and the, really, the thing that we are celebrating today is that our camp management house from now on is more strong, more solid, can shelter the affected population better and also made us uh, more accountable. And now I'm happy to give the floor to Massimo La Rosa, who is thematic expert on port displacement, migration and social protection for DG ECHO, for some remarks on the importance of the minimum standards. Massimo, over to you. Uh, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, thanks uh, a lot for uh, the opportunity to discuss with you. Uh, it has been a, a, a great uh, uh, chance to, to share a few reflections. I, I would like to say that as a DG ECHO, probably my contribution today is also to um, discuss some uh, and, and, and share some observation on, on the evolution, on the way how so uh, for displaced population uh, are supported nowadays from, from, from let's say a, a donor's perspective there is a, a policy and operational level especially in the last uh, four to five years i would say um it, let, let me start with a, a few uh, works a few, few words on, on the policy side what, what you see here is, and this is my only slide for uh, the the presentation is um, uh, is representing a, a milestone from the European Union. This is a, a, a one pager that summarizes the 2016 EU communication on forced displacement and development, uh, supported by the 2018 guidance. And this is the way how we hope to summarize uh, the way in which uh, uh, innovative financing and uh, hopefully operationalization of the nexus are all combined in in the new effort from the european union and its member states that uh, subscribe for for this policy uh, in a nutshell here as you can see we have uh, an idea of uh, a change in the paradigm to support uh, refugees and and idps and uh, all of the people in need uh, if displaced and the, the idea behind is that the, the only way we, in which we can improve uh, the work is uh, that it is a, a, an opportunity not only from the humanitarian uh, perspective, but only with the key and direct involvement of development and with what we call peace and political uh, units, we can uh, try to improve uh, the uh, the support to to look at uh, durable solutions on the long term. I will not go through all these documents, but this is summarized also, as you can see in the very uh, bottom left side, it say in a little bullet point, avoid camps. And uh, and this is what we uh, hope for. This is the, 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 the priority of the European Union saying out of camp policy should be any time as possible prioritized. But in reality, we know that there are still contexts in which camps are needed, and that's why minimum standards are needed. The key issue, in my opinion, in the evolution of the uh, process in these days is that uh, in many uh, protracted crises around the world, more and more often, the humanitarian donors and the humanitarian partners are not anymore uh, the one leading especially from the donor's perspective, I would say that in the last few years, we saw an opportunity, but also some risks. Uh, only from the European side, there are several crises from the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa, where development donors became the major source of funding to provide support to the people in humanitarian needs. And they are funding sometimes the same specialized agencies that know very well the business, but in other circumstances, they are funding uh, different category of stakeholders. In one hand, uh, host government, that they should have the lead in every single country if they respect the minimum standard. In other context, uh, civil society organization from uh, the, the country, so to enhancing the grand bargain commitment on localization. And in other context, there is a direct involvement also of the private sector and international financial institutions as well. We know that, for instance, the colleagues of the World Bank are supporting, uh, in some crises, directly uh, refugees and displaced population. So as I say that, in one hand, the innovative financing and the uh, commitment from several 
different key stakeholders became extremely important to look at also the medium and the long term. Camp management alone, we know that is not a solution for the people, it should be seen always as a transitional phase for something else, something that could lead to uh, integration, return, resettlement, anything that is much longer and sustainable for the people. But in reality, as we say, that due to the number of uh, of the, and the frequency of the conflicts and the fragility in, in many countries, uh, there, there are still uh, many contexts in which the uh, uh, camp management is, is key. So the concern that I have, uh, and uh, we witness uh, sometimes uh, doing our monitoring uh, around, is that when there are a number of new uh, key stakeholders joining the group of specialized agencies, not always there is a clear understanding of what is the minimum standard to reach. And that's why I would say that uh, this new document and publication in theory is going to help to help not only those that are already aware and specialize in this business, but many newcomers that most probably will have a, a stronger role in the future, hopefully. And in this uh, category, I would consider uh, the peace element of what we talk often in the European Union in terms of operationalizing the nexus. Uh, more and more, when we look at minimum standard, uh, we are obliged to look at the legal framework uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, we'll say, uh, framing the minimum standard for the national and non-national in the specific context. Uh, that means that why, in one hand, we need to uh, support all of those that day to day are the camp managers to support uh, the people in need. On the other hand, what is became uh, even more clearer in the last few years is that uh, always uh, uh, through our embassies and uh, our uh, civil servants, we need to keep open the negotiation with uh, uh, the host government uh, to to see uh, and 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 work on policy reforms uh, together uh, to guarantee what are the rights and entitlements of the people in need in any, any given context. We know that there is a long way to go, uh, but we hope that uh, from a, a little angle, the European Union can contribute to, to all of this. Uh, maybe just a few uh, final remarks from my side. Um, and this is also about the, the business model in which we are working. Eh? And uh, if, uh, a question that I would say not often we ask to ourselves is uh, if uh, we still agree that the current business model is fit for the purpose, while we invest a lot of energy often to gain some efficiency uh, in, in the current business. And uh, I, I would say that the, if we look at also the COVID uh, and the experience that we had in the last uh, couple of years now, uh, the COVID-19 was an accelerator in many contexts of uh, uh, policy processes. What happened in 2020 in some specific sectors, for instance, uh, supporting a, a displaced population, it, it was extremely important and made some uh, significant change uh, in, in situation where uh, we could not even imagine. And what I want, want to say is that uh, the COVID was a wake-up call for many of us to reconsider if the current business model is still fit for the purpose. So one more time, what I would like to share is that while in one hand we need to look at on the day-to-day -day life of the people in need in the camps, we need also to reconsider if the overarching objective and the way how we would like to achieve in terms also of strategy, programming and coordination, it fits especially in the context, as I said, where the humanitarians are not anymore uh, the one uh, leading in all the specific contexts, while there is a strong involvement from the political and the development side as well. And what we need to avoid clearly are uh, parallel systems uh, anytime that is possible. I would like to say thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure uh, for me to be here today, and I hope to uh, complement maybe a few more remarks and during the, the, the Q&A and, and the discussion uh, later on. Uh, I would like to say that ECHO is uh, uh, working on the um, 
several innovative financing instruments, and one of those that I would like to underline is happening. We've acted, by the way. Uh, we decided a few years ago to start what we call uh, the programmatic partnership uh, in order to have a multi-year funding from humanitarian, uh, from a humanitarian donor with uh, strategic partners to try to look at more often on outcomes and not only at output. And often are uh, is, a, is an obligation from from a very short project cycle. So this is just a, a, a little, I would say, uh, information to share that I also from from Eco side we are trying to look inside the house. I invite you to read the, the humanitarian aid communication of March 2021. That is the, the key strategic document that we recently published. Thank you very much, and uh, um, my congratulations for the publication on that platform. Over to you. Thank you so much, Massimo. That was really uh, interesting to hear Echo perspective. And I'm ending over to Tom right now. Okay, slight panic. My Zoom switched off, switched back on again. I'm back. <laughs> so today's going well. Um, thanks to, to, to Massimo for those uh, comments. And, and, and what I uh, find very interesting from it is, is how the standards is starting to already um, kind of slot into different processes, whether it's at a very high kind of echo strategic level, but also as we've heard in previous events, um, slotted into day-to-day -day activities in, in, in individual camps. And I, and I do think even though it's only um, today is the, the, the official launch, it's already starting uh, to play an important role in, in, in so many different uh, work streams and ideas and, and, and processes. Um, and so thank you um, for those comments. So we will move on. Um, what, uh, what me and Jennifer have tried to do over the many events that we've, that we've had over the last, um, well, many months is to have a variety of different speakers, different uh, perspectives, um, whether they're, very operational, whether they're very, very strategic. And so um, as today is quite celebratory, um, we wanted to look back in time a little uh, and to gather some of the people who have, who have worked on different aspects um, and at different times on the, the, the drafting of, 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 the, of the standards and that have got the document um, to where it is today. They're very much the kind of coal miners at the coal face, they've spent the hours um, writing, drafting, editing, discussing, um, running many of our field testing um, and, and, and piloting activities. And so I'm pleased to say, and hopefully many people on the call will already um, know or have certainly heard from the, 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 the the three people that we have today. We have Kit Dyer, a WASH advisor seconded uh, to UNHCR, uh, Nicholas Stirrup, the humanitarian advisor to Oxfam, and I feel probably just butchered his surname, um, and Andrew Cusack, who is a senior planner for housing and policy for the city of Victoria. Um, so maybe if we start with Andrew, um, maybe if you could tell me a little bit about how a senior planner for housing and policy for the city of Victoria is, is involved in CCCM um, and, and, and maybe how you, you kind of, or how you ended up um, being there um, very much at the start of this process. Sure, uh, just saying hi to everyone, a lot of familiar names and faces. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, so, Senior planner, the city of Victoria is a very new hat for me, uh, uh, even just a few months. Uh, my former hat uh, that I, where I know everyone here from is uh, as part of the CCCM team at UNHCR. And I remember trying to, my dates, uh, please forgive me if I'm a year or so off in some of these dates, but when we first started writing our first ECHO proposal, I wanna say in 2013, you can nod or, or say no, Jen, I can see you 
if yeah okay good uh then we had just sort of missed the most recent launch of the sphere standards and so we already at that date had included the idea of of getting cccm standards included as part of sphere but uh the idea of uh bringing it forward i think seemed quite daunting to the clusters who had these massive projects to implement and uh, also to sphere who had just shared this latest launch and weren't really interested in making such big changes right away. And, and I think that we sort of focused on all of the other work that was included as part of that proposal and rewriting the camp management standards, uh, getting rapid response and, and other, you know, just huge projects to get lifted and, and on the way. So this has been part of the idea from the very beginning, but uh, didn't gain traction, I think, until later when we had a better foundation under ourselves. And maybe a, 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 almost quite a blunt question is that you were there at the start. Why, um, why do you kind of feel that that star, why did we not have these in 2010, in 2005, in 2002, and, and, and maybe, um, yeah, like what, what, what kind of stopped this getting off the ground? Well, I think the... It was ships passing in the night, if you will. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the two cluster leads for CCCM had enough you know, experience under their belt, time as cluster uh, lead organizations with CCCM. Even though it started in 2005, it still felt really nascent. Uh, and we're trying to get organized and, and off the ground and, and getting the cluster more established. While Sphere had uh, already what was on its second edition and, and definitely writing and preparing for its third edition uh, and had those standards sort of ensconced and set. And so wasn't necessarily reaching out to other uh, clusters or, or sectors to include more standards as well. There, there wasn't, they weren't interested. They had something that was working and uh, were, were refining it and improving it. At least that's, you know, my impression for what it's worth. I, it, Wonderful. We won't, we won't hold you to the word. Um, well, 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 thank you. And, and, and I'm sure from, from spending time with you in, in, in Bangladesh, looking back to that time, there were unprecedented levels of displacement into the country, the development of, of, of what became uh, the mega camp, as, as many have, mm. have, have called it, um, and how useful that standards document would have been there. Um, um, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. So thank you um Andrew for those for those words so I will move on um to Nicholas who is hopefully joining us from Denmark yes I can confirm that I'm joining from Denmark great to oh. be here um so Nicholas maybe uh, I I know you're currently with, with with Oxfam but maybe if um if, if you could kind of tell us a little bit of um, of sort of your thoughts on the standards, how you were involved in this in this um, 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 process, and, and and yeah, I mean, some of your thoughts on the on the launch of the standards today. Yeah, thanks, Tom, and uh, great to hear the people who've been uh, talking so far, and especially Andrew, that I that I know from this small world and haven't seen in a long time. But uh, yes, I used to work with uh, DRC and as a global emergency advisor, I would roam around to uh, the different crises uh, in which DRC uh, already had or wanted potentially to have uh, a role in the humanitarian response. And the humanitarian unit that I was part of in DRC um, had an ambition to uh, to do something good around camp management. Um, I think that my role and the role of DRC to a large extent when it comes to the standards and the work of the global cluster, uh, the strategic advisory group has been to sort of drive home the point that even though everyone agrees that camps are the last resort, we would much rather see uh, people uh, have freedom of movement and the full set of rights and, and a durable solution. We did and we do live in a world where camps are 
very much part of reality. And sort of our agenda throughout has been to insist that the standards that people can meet in those camps and the dignity of the life that they can lead should be similar across different contexts. And whether you are a refugee or an IDP, which is sort of some of some of the, the things that I could also see uh, in my work was that often I came out to quite different versions of, of, of camps, obviously, but also of what the role of camp management was. So there was something basic about around accountability in that. I mean, when you have camp management and you have a cluster, a camp management or CCCM cluster, of course, other members of the humanitarian community and not least the people we work for, they need to have some sort of expectation about what our role is and what they can meaningfully expect from us and vice versa, I would say. Where the standards sort of has, has a really good potential, I think, is sort of also to demystify what camp management actually is. Um, so a little bit in line with the with the camps being the last resort and, and being a little bit, uh, I would say, even frowned upon uh, in some contexts. Uh, I think that with the standards, it'll be more clear for, for other members of the humanitarian community and the places where we work, the people that we work for, what it is that our role as camp management is, how it is that we will interact with people and how it is that people can interact with us and what expectations they can have there. And I think the standards is a leap forward uh, in terms of that uh, accountability and that sort of harmonization, obviously, across different contract contexts and different people living in camps. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and, and, and certainly that's that's one of the the questions as a camp manager you often hear is what does a camp manager do? Um, and I think even sort of camp managers themselves sometimes disagree about what we what we actually do. And 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 and, and certainly the standards are raising that accountability. So thank you, um, Nicholas. Andrew, are you do you have your hand in there? Yes, I was just going to ask if I could throw in a quick point on um, you were mentioning at the beginning of when all this started. I think even as camp managers, we didn't know sort of where our responsibilities started and stopped. And so this the the idea of discussing the standards was an opportunity for us to be really introspective about our role in all of that and and to more clearly uh, attempt to define where our roles and responsibilities started and stopped with all of the other clusters. And I think that's why this work is really so seminal and, and for people to understand just how much effort and communication and dialogue went into discussions with every cluster as well as all of the stakeholders uh, is really important. It's really impressive. No, absolutely. And, and, and sometimes that idea of being held to different standards right as a camp manager being measured on let's say wash sphere standards um is it, incredibly problematic if your wash partners are, are failing but then how do you show the steps that the camp manager is doing to try alleviate that 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 problem so on the subject of wash this is brilliant totally planned is kit diet you're a, a wash <laughs> advisor seconded to you in hr what is a wash person doing in a cccm meeting they never have <laughs> meetings. Um, tell me a little bit um, about um, your, your, your kind of role, this editing role, and maybe some of your thoughts as a, 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 a WASH person um, coming into the CCCM world. Thanks, Tom. I think that's a little harsh. We would never attend a CCCM meeting. I mean, I may have been to one or two in my time, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And uh, I think Andrew um, put his finger on it is where does camp management stop and start? And that that's how I got involved. Um, I was a uh, co-author for the WASH chapter of Sphere and, and had been working with the Sphere handbook since I started in this work. So this was something Sphere is something I'm very familiar with in the wash sector in particular. And we, I think most of the authors were asked through Sphere to comment on an earlier version of the camp management standards 
And I think I was probably a little bit harsh, let's say. Um, and I sat in on a discussion about that with the, 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 the working group was really kind to invite me to that. And at the end of that, uh, I walked away with a, a job editing the, the, the new standards. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is, is this stopping and starting. What are the boundaries? Because I came to camp management uh, with very little understanding of actually what camp managers do. And this was a very big learning exercise for me. <laughs> I think I spent all of that six month time that I was engaged with, with through IOM, I think I spent most of that time learning practically every week something new. And through that and through the engagement of talking to people who are camp managers and talking to other people who are like me, unaware of what camp managers do, we tried to then phrase the standards so that not just camp managers can look at it and say, this is what I will be held accountable to, but so that, you know, a, a wash person who understands wash, but not much else can pick it up and also go, oh, I get it now. I see where that works. I see how we're going to work together. Um, and then taking that a little bit further, uh, we deliberately then set up to make the document, the, the, the physical document look like the other standards it looks like sphere it looks like INEE the education one um, deliberately so that we can have that conversation uh, I think uh, Mr Vittorini talked about Vittorino you know, sorry talked about that earlier that meaningful dialogue and if we've got tools that enable that meaningful dialogue that's so much better than not having that tool so that was something that I think I brought to the table and that was definitely one of my objectives is to have that clarity so that we can have that discussion into the future. Wonderful. And no, I, I, I certainly remember having very long um, <laughs> Skype calls with you while <laughs> trying to badly explain what I'd done in the past as a camp manager and then you quite succinctly summarizing it in three bullet points. I mean, for that, you deserve <laughs> a, a, a medal. And so Thanks, for Tom. all three um, of you today, I, I mean, firstly, thanks for attending today and for sharing these, um, these insights. And I think that institutional knowledge or, or history is, is very important um, now that we've got to the launch and, and kind of keeping a record of it and, and ensuring that we know where the standards came from um and obviously secondly thanks for the many hours um that all three of you um put into this process it, this isn't um a document that has been rushed it's not a document that has been siloed or or, or produced by kind of one person and, and then pushed out it was a very collaborative very exhaustive process um, and, and, and we thank all three of you for your, for your part um, in that. And I think all three of you raised um, points that will um, be reflected by our um, next speaker. For those of us who were at um, the CCCM retreat, which I, I was gonna say was last week, but I think it was about a month ago, um, for those who <laughs> for those who can keep track of time and we're at the CCCM retreat, um, you will um, recognize um, uh, the, the, the next speaker. Um, his words um, at the CCCM retreat uh, certainly struck a chord with a lot of people, which led us to actually ask him to uh, come back um, and 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 to and and to speak again at this launch event, knowing that there would be different faces, maybe some new perspectives in the uh, of of audience members, maybe audience members who are not part of 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 the of the retreat, or maybe even necessarily um, part of global CCM cluster. Um, and so, I'd like to introduce Philip Deloy humanitarian advisor to um, FCDO, the, uh, the Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office, um, who, who will now kind of share some of his thoughts and some of the thoughts um, from that donor quite high level perspective on um, the standards and, and, and their launch today. So over to you, Philip, who is hopefully here. 
Hi, Tom. Hope, hope you can hear me okay. Yes, perfectly. Okay, fabulous. Thanks very much for, for the kind introduction and, and reflections. I'm hoping this will not be uh, overly familiar to you. All this is slightly uh, redrafted version of some words that I said previously. Um, I'm going to start out with, uh, with a quote, and it's a simple one. I wish I'd had these when I started out. Um, and I, I heard this phrase uh, so often during the interviews that I undertook with camp managers and coordinators in preparation for, for both last week or indeed whenever it was. Time's gotten pretty elastic during this pandemic um, and in preparation for today. And those words, I think, uh, will be spoken by just about everyone in the humanitarian sector, as, as Kit was saying. They applied it to everybody um, looking across standards, um, as we all need to do. Uh, as, a, as a former NGO staffer, Red Cross volunteer, UN staffer, cluster coordinator, and now humanitarian advisor to a donor, I've worked alongside and in support of CCCM colleagues in, in a huge range of capacities and locations across continents. And, uh, and previously, I still struggled to, to articulate what camp management is and, and what it should be. Um, if I'm honest, it seemed almost a, a kind of sorcery where, where only the initiated folks really knew what was going on. Um, and, and these new standards have changed that dramatically. Um, they've helped me uh, in particular, and I'm sure loads of others, understand what camp managers and, and by extension, uh, CCCM cluster coordinators actually do. Uh, reading them has helped me to appreciate for, uh, for the first time what was a, a really significant gap in my humanitarian education. Uh, the, new, the new minimum standards help address something fundamental, uh, the issue of professionalization in our humanitarian sector. Um, my personal default is to worry about the stratification of guidance and standards. Um, by that, I mean relatively few standards are replaced or consolidated compared to the number that are added. So I'm normally opposed to the addition of new guidance without consolidation. But like the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, the UK recognizes that these minimum standards address a genuine and long-standing gap in how to ensure better AAP, accountability to affected populations, representation and enabled governance. They make a huge contribution towards making aid fairer, more consistent, replicable, and measurable. They've been admitted to the HSP at a time and in a thoughtfully developed format that raises wide awareness of what camp management is and ought to be, more than perhaps any other document previously. Uh, they drive accountability to affected populations in a whole new way. Um, Another quote, um, I'm going to go to, uh, to global CCCM expert and current cluster coordinator in Ethiopia, also a friend of mine, I'm glad to say, Rafael Abis. They're more akin to the humanitarian charter than some of the other technical chapters of Sphere. They enable a more fulsome delivery of the rights-based approach. They are an expression of the rights of the individual. I know we all have mixed views um, on, on the idea of what dignity is and whether we as humanitarians have the ability or indeed the right to suggest that anyone can confer it on someone else. But I hope you won't mind my suggesting that these standards may help us to better define in a humanitarian context what that ought to mean. The minimum standards step up per participation self-representation, site governance by providing all of the key actions and the sequencing needed for planning how to do this. Um, in practical terms, what, what can they help us with? What, what can the minimum standards in camp management help practitioners with? They highlight best practices. They help to identify what's being missed, even for experts. They can and, and have already led to increased community engagement. They can be used to advocate to host governments and to donors, and they, they can and now should be used as a benchmark for proposals. They enable better service mapping. The handbook can help with consistency, comparison, prioritization, and with handovers. They can be drawn into national strategies. Their design means that they can be easily contextualized. And this last action is key for localization of the standards. And I'm gonna flip that 
I'm going to say that the standards themselves will help to enable localization. They can, and I believe will, support LNGOs to act as camp management agencies. They've already been used by national governments to inform approaches to disaster management. They can be used within national preparedness, early warning, and contingency planning. That humanitarians can use them for advocacy purposes on all of the above is thanks to a really thoughtful development process. It's been collaborative, it's been iterative. The development process drew from a huge set of inputs and it went through pilot implementation, monitoring and validation before finalization. CCCM colleagues, HSP and PHAP worked with a wide range of other actors to ensure solid attention was placed on disability inclusion and linkages to other critical standards and guidance. Too many to name, but a couple examples being the minimum economic recovery standards, minimum standards in child protection, and IASC guidance on GBV. And I'm sure as new standards come online, that specific reference to them will be included too. The, uh, the team deserves real pr praise for the process, including the working group, their respective agencies, all cluster membership agencies, and those involved in field testing. I'd like to highlight contributions from the SMS sector in Cox's Bazaar, IOM Mozambique, ASB Greece, national NGOs in Somalia, and the government of the Philippines. Doing so much of this remotely over the past year warrants additional praise. Dissemination of the standards, um, hugely advanced by their induction into the HSP, it still remains a big job. It's, uh, it's going to take it's going to require a lot of materials translation. It's going to require a lot of information sharing and training. It's going to take putting them in proposals from now. Um, this is going to take, uh, this is going to support uptake of the standards. It's going to take a lot of monitoring. I'd suggest it's going to require significant revision of meal handbooks and internal indicator guidance for humanitarian agencies. It's going to take considerable effort to start seeing the standards in humanitarian response plans, but HRPs are where I think we all want to see them. Um, please allow me uh, to share my own favorite thing about the standards. Um, they help us as a humanitarian community better address critical social and societal needs. They deal with some of the higher levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Most of the humanitarian sector deals with tier one physiological needs. And thanks to the protection principles and do no harm, all of us deal with tier two safety needs. But the minimum standards in camp management take us further on the course towards enabling greater fulfillment in life for displaced people. Through concrete and measurable actions, they push us to enable affected people to be better recognized. And I, I can't overstate how important I think that is. Um, I mentioned earlier that Raphael had very neatly described the chapters as being more akin to the humanitarian charter than to some of the other technical chapters of SPHERE. And this is where and exactly how I'd like to see the standards in 2025 or whenever the next SPHERE handbook comes out. Uh, I want to give credit once more to all those who've made these minimum standards for camp management what they are today, um, a massive push forward for the humanitarian sector on behalf of displaced people. Uh, thanks to all involved and, and to you for your time and attention and, and thanks for having me. Um, over from me. Cheers. Okay, thanks again um, to, 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 to Philip for those comments and I, I think many of them um, reflect a lot of the talking points of, of Andrew and, and, and Kit and, and, and Nicholas and even the, 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 the other speakers from today. So moving on, I will hand over to, who am I handing up to? Um, to Jern. Thanks yes, a lot. Right. Oh, man. A terrible transition. I'm handing over. I'm getting out. <laughs> it was too easy for you that uh, wash transition earlier. So it's nice that you also meet some of the challenges of camp management, uh, which is to identify the stakeholders uh, and uh, and back to that i think that uh, as andrew addressed uh, and uh, the challenges we have had in this constant identification of uh, the work we do what do we do and uh, uh, what uh, are our ways of doing it if there is uh, insufficient water provision in a camp or if there is uh, 
domestic violence happening in a tent. All of these things have been part of these identification processes. And, uh, and thanks a lot to Philippe who uh, put words on that and uh, show how this kind of face-to-face -face accountability to the affected population is one of the important strengths of you know, camp management. What does it really mean in people's daily life? And then how can we ensure to close the gaps in the humanitarian responses? Um, so these uh, standards, uh, they are a train we ride together and uh, we also ride it together with the CBOs and the local authorities, national authorities and uh, humanitarian organizations and agencies. And I, I think that another very important point Philip made was that it is a very important tool in the localization ambitions because they also help to addressing the site specific needs to help us uh, enable better understanding of hopefully the local authorities engaging in managing sites and to better understand that i could go further on to exemplify but um that for another session um and what does this mean to uh, NRC and NORCAP? Nor, uh, since uh, Sierra Leone around uh, 1991, uh, NRC has uh, engaged uh, in uh, the knowledge cultivation of the, the later to become cluster and uh, uh, being a um, a custodian of the camp management toolkit and also the capacity building efforts of the cluster. So uh, to, to further uh, improve the way we have guidance and standards is, uh, is very core to adapting or delivery to people and in uh, the training of our staff and partners. Uh, and we work with communities worldwide. Uh, so to, to ensure that we have proper programming to uh, uh, function well across cultures and uh, country borders, uh, these, these standards uh, are a very important tool. And, uh, and then of course, becoming part of the bigger family and also on the overarching um, strategic ambitions of the humanitarian community is, is important to the CCM cluster and the CCM actors. We act on the grassroots. We address the gaps in humanitarian actions by identifying it and by solving it through coordination, through provision of uh, the needed services. But uh, becoming part of the HSP uh, family is uh, to me a clear symbol that what we do on the grassroots level is informing the overarching strategic decisions and actions taken by national authorities and um, protection actors and um, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, the, the bigger sphere of uh, stakeholders. So. Uh, to comment on this, we have uh, brought in uh, the executive director of Sphere, Dr. Balwan Singh. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, these ambitions and these commitments from the CCM side speaks as well to you as, uh, as it does to us. Um, so uh, maybe you can. Uh, give us uh, some thoughts on uh, on uh, the standards and uh, and what are your expectations when we now launch this thank you very much uh, Ewan, for the introduction um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts as well uh, on behalf of sphere first of all i'd like to congratulate all of those who've made these camp management standards a reality I should also add how much I have learned about camp management as we have supported the development and review of these standards. 
I wanted to start off by just looking at why do humanitarian standards matter and why do camp management standards matter? Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that humanitarian crises keep increasing in scale, complexity, and, and duration. And the vulnerability of people affected by these crises is multiplied when populations are displaced. This is further magnified when the displacement is repeated, particularly in increasingly harsh political, economic, and social contexts. And I think this severely tests the resilience of people and communities. Just talk to any refugee, displaced person, camp manager, or humanitarian worker. Uh, their proximity and daily lived experience in these settings brings a gr glaring realities for displaced people right to the fore. So humanitarian standards in general and camp man management standards in particular draw on a wealth of experience, expertise, knowledge, and evidence to provide a consistent, reliable, and predictable framework for humanitarians to support communities but also for communities to know and understand what support they can expect, how, the, how they'll receive this and when as well. So to me, standards take the guesswork out of humanitarian responses. They provide a, a really invaluable tool for planning. They help communications and engagement with communities, which I think have been touched on by a few other speakers already. They also provide a basis for upholding the rights of people affected by crises. Uh, now, they form the basis for resource allocation by governments, donors, and organizations, and are also a framework for monitoring and evaluation of the adequacy, effectiveness, and efficiency of humanitarian responses. Now, I think they are a tool to hold people, organizations, and governments to account, and they harness and build on the different contexts and resilience of people and communities. After all, they are about people and communities. Now, some people will wonder, you know, are global standards really suitable for, for different contexts? And the camp management standards, from what we've heard, have been developed through extensive collaboration, global consultations, and field testing, but with uh, at least uh, 15 years of field experience, you know, brought into to the work as well. And these consultations, importantly, have included inputs from displaced communities, and this is critical. Standards are only as useful, in my view, as the sense of ownership they foster, which comes from engaging communities, humanitarian practitioners and experts alike. Therefore, I think I, I'm not concerned about the time it's taken to evolve these standards and involve people because that is absolutely right. And we'll make sure that these standards continue to be useful for a long, long time to come. Now they're global standards, but they can be applied and adapted for different contexts, taking account of local realities. They also include guidance for area-based camp settings and out-of-camp operations. In this way, the standards provide guidance to practitioners in continuously evolving contexts. And in, in my view, uh, the, the, these standards are user-friendly, they are well-articulated, and they're accessible uh, you know, for, for camp management and, and particularly for pe displaced people to understand uh, what they can expect as well. Now, let me turn to the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. Uh, a few of you have mentioned this. Uh, we are, first of all, very delighted to welcome the minimum standards in camp management to the Humanitarian Standards Partnership family. They were formally approved as members of the HSP in June of this year. Now, the HSP is hosted and coordinated by Sphere and has grown out of Sphere's companionship model, which was established back in 2007 to formalize the relationship between Sphere and new standards initiatives, which follow Sphere's process, approach, structure, and terminology. Now, the goal of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership is to improve quality and accountability through consistent universal application of humanitarian standards. And the intention, which I know some of you also mentioned before, is to minimize duplication and build on an approach which is already widely embraced. And the Humanitarian Standards Partnership links the why, the how, and the what of humanitarian work. Uh, and and I, I don't think I need to, to preach to those who are already familiar with this. So the humanitarian charter is critical because it provides the ethical and legal basis of humanitarian action, the protection principles, which some of you have mentioned, the core humanitarian standard, which describes the essential commitments for accountable, effective, qual and, and quality humanitarian action, and minimum standards, they are the what. And these are the universal benchmarks. And at the moment, the HSP includes uh, standards on shelter and settlement, water, sanitation and hygiene promotion, food security and nutrition, health, education, child protection, 
livestock, economic recovery and market analysis, and now camp management. Together, these outline the assistance and protection people are entitled to, as well as their right to life with dignity. Now, these have been developed by, by experts globally through extensive uh, consultations, but also based on, on evidence and experience. And the humanitarian charter protection principles and the core humanitarian standard are all reflected in the camp management standards, including the key actions and indicators as well. A final thing I want to touch on is that camp management is a cross-cutting issue and sector. And the structure of the standards is aligned with the core technical standards in SPHERE. And this makes it easier for users to reference SPHERE and all the HSP standards. The HSP app, which some of you may be familiar with and hopefully are using, and also the HSP digital plat platform, provides access to the HSP standards, which now include camp management. We are also uh, take, uh, un, uh, uh, undertaking some work at the moment to map themes across some of the standards as well. As well. And we're hoping to, to uh, share this uh, uh, probably early in 2022. The digital platform for HSP makes looking up standards and using them easier. And, and I think there'll be a demonstration of this at a later stage. Finally, I just wanted to close with a few of my own personal reflections related to the pandemic. Now, early on in the pandemic, I was asked to speak on humanitarian organizations and their resilience. And it made me reflect on human nature. When we are confronted with ambiguity, anxiety, worrying news and overwhelming circumstances, which are typical of most humanitarian crises, we experience a stage of unproductive uncertainty. As we begin to make sense of what we can do and how we can help, we develop what I call is uncertain capability. Humanitarian standards and the camp management standards matter because when they are, when they are put into practice, they reframe what seems impossible or uncertain initially, and they contribute to a stage called productive certainty. So I would like to end by, uh, you know, by just congratulating and thanking the many people and organizations who have worked hard, consulted extensively, and shared their valuable uh, experience and expertise to develop these minimum standards for camp management. I also encourage all of you to consider how affected communities can access, understand, and apply these standards, because there's always room to make them more user-friendly as we keep finding out at Sphere from the feedback we continue to receive on a regular basis. So I will say thank you very much and, and back to you. Thank you, uh, Bawa, for those um, for those words, and um, and 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 I think um, it, it, the, the 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 camp management stands becoming part of HSP is is um, is fantastic, and it has taken time, um, but now it is part of the family. So I am now going to attempt something that um, no one should ever do which is to live demo uh, <laughs> an online platform through a Zoom call, which this could go horribly wrong, but hold on, it, it, it could work. Um, now, as Balwant was saying, and hopefully people can see, um, as the, the minimum standards for care management is part of, of the, of the HSP, it has its rightful place um, uh, as part of the interactive handbook. Um, we have been working day and night, particularly nights, it feels, um, on getting um, the, 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 the standards um, into the platform um, and, and, and up and running. So for those that thought that um, the minimum standards would just be a dry, dusty PDF that, that was that had limited functionality, you would be wrong. Um, it would have been much easier. Uh, so as we can see on the platform, we have Sphere, we have minimum uh, standards for education, and we go down through many other um, uh, great standards. But here it is, finally, the minimum standards for camp management. Um, as you can see, it is only in English. Um, and this is um, one of the many tasks that we um, will be tackling over the coming weeks and months is to have that translation 
but having it translated means that we don't, uh, and, and on the platform means we don't then have multiple copies floating around. It can all be part of this one platform. It can all be found here. And so here it is, the standards document in its beautiful um, and interactive um, um, setup. So for example, uh, for the contents page, we can very easily um, jump to the first standard, um, standard one, site management policies and um, capacities. Within this, um, within the document itself, we can um, have links to different parts of um, the document. So for example, um, policies and capacities that then very obviously very quickly leads into uh, participatory aspects of site management. So we can jump to 2.1. Look, it's working. They're keep praying. Um, and um, we then also have um, the ability to uh, link to documents outside of the system. Um, so whether there are particular reports such as wanting to read more about the rights of persons with disabilities, we can um, jump to the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm not gonna click it because I'm not pushing my luck. I, we, we, it does work though, I do promise that. Um, what is also, I think, incredibly exciting um, with the interactive platform is the search functionality. So we can search across all of the handbooks. And if I can remember how to spell governance, um, I think that's right. <laughs> um, we can hopefully, yes, and I did manage to spell it right. We can look through the, the minimum standards for camp management and see where governance is um, mentioned. But, and obviously it's mentioned a lot, we can also then look at um, the MERS handbook and see where governance there is mentioned. Um, we can look then to the sphere handbook to then see where governance is mentioned there. And so we then begin to build these linkages between the different standards. And as camp managers or those involved with camp management know how cross-cutting multi-sectoral and multi-cluster, the role of a camp manager is, um, we, we know how important it is for the minimum standards of camp management to not be a standalone document, but as that linkage, the CCCM roof that we talk about. Um, and so the search functionality, um, should then be key in, 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 in making this a, a user-friendly document. If you're up late at night, desperately writing your proposals because you want to get them in for the deadline, the platform is there um, to help. Um, so if we go back, hopefully keep working to the standards um, document, this is um, a document that will continue to evolve, we will be able to uh, tweak it as we find um, whether it's adding in new resources, maybe let's say fixing links and, 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 and as such. Um, but that this is it, this is the, 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 the minimum standards for camp management. It is live, it is, um, it, it should be available very soon, I understand, Jennifer. I mean, if it's not already live, I think it will be um, more, uh, at, at, at least um, very soon. And so... You can see your screen. Uh, sorry. If I, is everyone still here? Still here, we could just see your other screen. Okay, yes, Tom. right. I am going to stop sharing um, because you've now seen it and you will uh, very soon then have your own access um, to the, the online platform and, and to the standards um, document. And we obviously hope that there will be um, 
uh, very busy traffic over the next um, few weeks of, of people logging in and checking it out. Most importantly, it is um, for those working in maybe areas with, with, with somewhat poor internet, there is the ability to export this as a PDF. So it can be printed, it can be shared in, in that manner. Um, but the standards itself will live here um, on the platform with this being um, the, um, the, 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 the key document, the, the, the cornerstone of those standards. So I will stop sharing um, and I will now briefly cover the question, well, what's next? I mean, we've done it, right? It's published. Do we get a break? Well, the answer is no. Um, we are now um, launching into um, further dissemination of the standards. Um, a few months ago, Myself and, 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 and Jennifer talked with representatives uh, from child protection minimum standards. And they, over the course of, of, of about two hours, went through the many activities, the many um, events, uh, trainings, and capacities they ran um, following the launch of their standards. And it is clear that we have possibly only just started this process. Uh, there is a massive amount of work still to be done. Um, there will, as, um, as, as, as we go through this year, be more announcements, um, more events. Um, I can say that for those that um, were at the CCCM retreat, we somewhat auctioned off um, Bruce um, to give a month of his time. Uh, Bruce will now be supporting um, the, the, the Yemen humanitarian mission there um, in um, establishing uh, the standards as, as, as part of their work, working with UN agencies with, um, and, and, and NGOs. Um, that is very much the tip of the iceberg. Um, there will be much more translation, as we've mentioned, uh, trainings, um, more dissemination events, um, but really um, we would like to end today by thanking everyone certainly for coming today. There, is there are many people here today who have put in hours um, of their own time um, in developing these standards and so we um, thank those. There are many people actually not on the call this has been a very large group effort and we, and we thank everyone really for their involvement in, in getting it this um, far. So thank you again. Um, and, and, and we are very, very happy to see the standards live, interactive, online, um, and, and, and very much ready to be used um, across the, 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 the many humanitarian um, operations that we have worldwide. So maybe if I hand over to Jennifer if, for, for, for further sort of, sort of final comments. Hopefully you're still here. Yes, I'm still here. So I, I just would love to have everybody unmute at this point and so that we can have a, a big hurrah. Um, I, I don't think it will be enough of a, of, a, of a noise, but it would be really great if we could just um, say thank you to everyone collectively because this has really been a 100% group effort. So thank you to our fine speakers and good friends. And yes, I love seeing the emojis, um, but as many people as possible, if you could um, put on your, we'll unmute. I have the power to do that. <laughs> hey. Yay. All right. Thanks so much for everybody for joining. We're only 20 minutes over, which <laughs> we knew would happen, but <laughs> thanks for people for staying on. Um, sorry for, for um, Gebre, who didn't get to speak and who had a, a kind of problem joining, but we're with... Um, each of you in spirit and are so happy to be uh, past this first hurdle and on to the next. So congratulations to all of us. And here Yay. we go, next big hurdle. Woohoo! Woohoo!
And now the time is for internal dissemination.